So um, the word that the Lord gave me today is pretty specific just for today and for this week. It actually came to me on Friday, and, and I want you to say it after me. It's just a short title. Say, my faith, my faith will, not will not fail. Now look at somebody else. Well, you didn't wait for the instructions. You're going too fast. No, no, be quiet, man. You're getting restless. When, when you look at them, say, your faith will not fail. Oh, man, let me tell you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. That's an encouraging word. Now, let me just say this. I think a couple just moved out of the sun to get in the shade because they were too hot. How cool is that? How cool is that? Thank you, Lord. I mean, I'm actually hot up here. That's awesome. Instead of heaters, we should have brought fans or something. But that's so good of God to give us this amazing gift to be together as the body of Christ, this window. I can remember in high school playing Thanksgiving football day game in the snow, right? So mid-November could be a little bit colder than this. So thank you, Lord, for that blessing. And, and Lord, I just pray that our ears would be open to hear what you want to say. I pray that I would be pliable in your hands to release the word that you gave me for today, that our faith is not going to fail. In the midst of all the turmoil around us, we're grounded and rooted in the word of God. You are the sure foundation. We are not building our house on sinking sand, but on the rock of Jesus Christ. No other rock. <laughs> I'm standing on your rock today in Jesus' name. Amen. So my ears are open, my spirit's open, and I want to receive that nourishment, right? This is the Bible is like food for our soul. And whenever we come together, it's not that just we're reading scripture, it's the word of the Lord for us for today. And, and I would say that that could be one of the greatest prayers you could pray for me and Trisha and our leadership team is that, that the portal above our lives is open and that we're hearing clearly from God, right? If we start there, that's a really good place to start. And that uh, from there, everything else should fall into place. So sometimes I get visions, and um, I had a flashback to a scene that I knew I had read about in the Bible, but I'll, I'll kind of unpack it a little bit. But if you just want to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22, that's where the text verse comes from. And it's a pretty well-known part of the Bible because it's right before Jesus goes to the crucifixion the following day, right? You know it as the upper room when Jesus brought the disciples to the upper room and how he had a prophetic word and he told the disciples to go before him and you're going to meet a man along the way, remember? Like, how did he know that? Because he's prophetic. He's operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Is he any different than we are? Say no. no. Do we have the gifts of the Spirit in us? Yeah. Yes, we do. Is it the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that's alive in us? Yes, yeah. yeah, so we don't have to think that he has this unfair advantage. He doesn't have an unfair advantage over us. He was just operating in communion with the Lord, right? I like to think of it this way, a come union. Lord, come and be unified with me, not a dumb union. <laughs> I don't want to be unified with the world, right? They don't have the right answer. I want to be with God. And he was communing with God 24-7. And that's what I think Paul meant when he said, pray at all times. Everything you're doing, submit it to the Lord and just keep checking in with him all day long, what you're about to say, what you're about to do, how you should um, monitor your time, how you should steward your day, right? There's just certain things that are built right in. Trisha had a word at the beginning of the year for 2020 that it was going to be a year of rebuilding our altar, all right? Boy, would that be true now in retrospect how important it was for us to rebuild our own personal altar? Never mind that the church was moving during COVID. So something that already would have been a complicated thing to do, we had to move with COVID and all of the restrictions and, and the parts that weren't getting delivered on time to reconstruct the chapel. To people that didn't want to come to work because at the beginning of COVID, they weren't sure and the governor put a ban on construction for a while. But look, you have to understand this wonderful verse in the Bible says, these light and momentary afflictions, are nothing compared to the glory that God will reveal through us and in us. So that these obstacles that we face are not meant to be the, the thing that pulls the rug out from underneath us. It's like, no, it's not by might, it's not by power. Lord, you're going to provide a way out. 
And Holy Spirit is a great avenue for that solution. So when we say open heaven over our lives, it's just, Lord, distractions are trying to invade my space all the time, but I want to hear from you. So Trisha said, rebuild the altar. I took it to heart because I think you heard my story when I was at Morgan Stanley. I, I would get on my knees in the morning and I would take communion at my desk. I was the first one in my office because I had to, part of my job was to get a newsletter out every day at 8 o'clock. So I had to be there by 6, 6.30 and look at what happened in Europe and overseas the day before, all the things that were happening in Asia because their markets open before ours does. So that was part of the job. I love the job, but there was a very defiling aspect of working in a culture where people are bound by mammon, okay? And they're not all bad people, but if they don't know the Lord and the love of money is the root of all evil, right? That's what Judas was, was betraying Jesus for the love of money, right? Like the love of money is the root of all evil. Then if I'm going into an environment, the environment's either going to impact me negatively or I'm going to impact the environment positively. Who do you want to be? That's an easy choice, isn't it? Yeah. But I had to be intentional about it. And, and taking communion at my desk, it wasn't supposed to be a spooky religious thing. It's just like, no, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, and I'm going to sanctify my workspace. Yeah. And, and it's going to be, become like an immune system against the defiling aspect, but it's also going to be a light that other people will be drawn to. And the prayer is, Lord, bring, your, bring my coworkers around me for prayer that if they're going through something, that I'll have a word for them, a word in season. The, the prophetic words and words of knowledge and words of wisdom aren't just meant for us in church. It could be the person checking you out at the grocery store. You could have a word for them. And, you know, I was telling somebody this week a testimony of a guy in New York City. There's something called the New Canaan Society in New York City, which is Christian businessmen that come together and study the Bible together. And the guy that was given the testimony one week He's a very, like, charming guy, good-looking guy, articulate. He comes from London, so he's got that great British accent, you know? It's just amazing. So he was an athlete. He's in shape. He's good-looking. He's funny. He's charismatic. He's smart. He's making a lot of money. The devil was having a heyday with this guy. Bring him here, Trisha said. Yeah, bring him here. She's prophesying. He was this close to committing suicide. All right? That's what I'm telling you. This is what the devil does. He gets us to overplay our strengths so they become a weakness. And that's right from Lisa Melillo. I don't want to take credit for that line. She told me that one over here. We have some amazing people in our church, full of wisdom, godly wisdom, that are applying this to the workforce. So what happened was this guy was going to have an affair. He was at a hotel. He was traveling on business. He, he, his wife was home with the kids, and they were not getting along. And it was just very easy in the natural realm for him to attract somebody you know, for illicit sex. And he was staying at the hotel. And he was ordering up from the bar to bring bottles of wine to his room before the girl was going to get there. And while he's waiting, the guy that brings the order in, and you know, a lot of you have stayed in hotels, you know who that guy is, right? He's doing the room service. Not somebody you would normally think of as a minister, right? But could he be? Of course, if he's a Christian, it doesn't matter where you are. You could be on a trading floor on Wall Street. You could be a, a construction worker on a job. It doesn't matter. Wherever you are, you're bringing the presence of God with you. So the guy walks in, and he brings the bottles of wine. And this, the guy I'm talking about in the story, had been witnessed to by people in his apartment building because they were on the same floor, and he would see people go into their apartment. And, and he could tell that they were... They were good people. They were, they were upbeat and happy, and they were friendly. And in New York, that's kind of uncommon. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. So they invited him to go to a Bible study at Redeemer. Presbyterian Church was a, a very popular church for young uh, professional people. He goes, and he didn't really understand it. And, and he didn't really, it didn't set you know, perfectly right with him, but a, a seed was planted. And we found out later that people at that Bible study were praying for him. So now he's in a hotel room about to do the dirty deed, right? Like He's, he's going to engage in, in a sin. The Bible calls it a gross sin, a violation of the covenant with his wife. But he didn't know there was a covenant relationship. He was living for the moment. The guy that delivers the wine, as he's starting to walk out, he said, God bless you, sir. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a big deal, does it? But, you know, the right thing at the right time... When it's anointed, it's amazing. It breaks the yoke. 
So the guy giving the testimony said, what did you say? I said, God bless you. Now, if you're the, you're the guy that brought the wine, you're thinking, uh-oh, he's going he's gonna to complain about me that I was talking about God, you know? The guy said, no, I said, God bless you. And the, and the, and the guy said, why did you say that? <laughs> this is called the hound of heaven. The Holy Ghost is the hound of heaven. And God will sick the hound of heaven on you even when you're about to have an affair. And the guy said, well, I just, uh, I'm a Christian. And as I walked in, I was praying for you. And I felt like the Lord wanted you to know that what you're about to do is a mistake. <laughs> Man, the right word at the right time. I'm telling you what, he fell down on his knees. <laughs> Called the girl, said, I can't do it. I mean, I'm telling you, there was a whole stack of things that happened, and it was just the right guy at the right time. And we sometimes feel so inadequate and so unable to do it and so inarticulate, and I need to memorize more scripture. Believe me, none of the disciples would have made it as, as one of the 12 if that was the standard, okay? The bar is not set real high, right, from, from a human skill standpoint. But by faith, they had a lot of faith. And somebody like Peter went from being somebody who was bound by the, the shame of denying Christ three times to becoming a pillar of the, of the New Testament church in the book of Acts, right? One guy said you could either be a pillar or a caterpillar. <laughs> so he went from being a caterpillar to being a pillar in the church, right? So that's what I want to talk about today, not just because he's my namesake, but it's because of where our text verse comes. Do you remember what you said to the person? You looked at them and you said, my faith will not fail. And I'm saying to you, your faith will not fail. That's from Luke chapter 22, verse 32. So if you're in Luke, that's the upper room scene. We're more than halfway through it if we start in verse 31, because Luke 22 starts with the whole story of the upper room. But I'm jumping in the middle because I want you to get perspective on, on how this happens, how, it, how we get here. And I want to encourage you to use the Bible tools that are online for free, okay? There's one called Bible Hub, free. Check it out. Bible Gateway, free. Check it out. All different uh, amazing amounts of tools. That's one of the videos I'm going to put up on our website is how to study the Bible with free tools that are available today and, and the tools that you can use that are out there. So they have many different versions in Bible Hub, and one of them is called the Berean Study Bible. And as I'm comparing different versions of Scripture, I tend to come back to that one a lot. Um, you know, obviously because the Bereans were the ones who had to study the Word, right? That's our example. And in this version, here's a familiar part of Scripture that's said a little bit differently, right? In verse 31, Jesus is speaking to Peter, but he's calling him Simon. And he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. Now, what's different about that than the way I was taught it was, I always heard Jesus say to Peter, Satan has sought to sift you as wheat. But they're saying, no, the implication is it's not just Peter, it's all the disciples. Well, which one do you think Satan would want? Just Peter or all the disciples? <laughs> well, so that's not too hard to believe then, is it? So if you hear that word from Jesus, that could bring fear on you. So right after Jesus says, Peter, actually Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, each of you, like wheat. But I have prayed for you. Woo! That's Jesus saying to Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And again, I'm just saying, let's, just, let's make this engaging. Look at somebody. I will pray for you that your faith will not fail. And I'm saying that to anybody watching on this right now, live streaming, or somebody that watches this video later. Your faith will not fail because Jesus is praying for us. That's what the Bible says. He forever lives to make intercession for us and for the church. And then he gives us this connection of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And it says in Romans chapter 8 that that spirit actually will speak on our behalf and pray with us, alongside of us. When we don't know what to say, he'll pray for us to the Father with expressions that go beyond just words. How powerful is this? Another one of the versions called the Kingdom New Testament says, God is the heart searcher. 
It's like when God hears the prayer in heaven, he has a lantern, and he's coming looking at a dark prison, and, and he's swinging this lantern. He's the heart ser searcher, and what he finds is the voice of Holy Spirit crying out to him on our behalf. Amen. That's living on the inside of you. Even when you don't know what to do, you look to the Lord, and Holy Spirit will come in and help you pray because the devil wants to rob your peace. You can't make good decisions when you're not ruling your spirit. And that doesn't mean a controlling thing. It's like, no, I'm not going to get rattled by what's going on around me. The only things that are going to get rattled are the dead bones. <laughs> From Elijah 37, right? <laughs> not Elijah said it in Ezekiel 37. My apologies. I don't mind being corrected. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. When you have turned back implies that his faith is going to fail. How many have been there? Yeah. You know, like, and even if you wouldn't say fail, that maybe that's too strong of a word, but that it was in doubt. And I don't know, I don't know where I stand right now in my relationship with the Lord. I feel like I'm in a valley or whatever you would say. Of course, that's part of the spiritual warfare. And we have all these wonderful verses like the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the demolishing of strongholds. That's warfare language. America is in spiritual warfare right now. Can we just solve that problem? And the people that say, no, God, it's, it's all about love. We're in a war. Deal with it. We're in a war. And he, and he equipped us to be brave soldiers and to engage and to occupy until he comes back. And we're not here with a little uh, cap gun, right? We have a nuclear arsenal to, count, to counter the arsenal of the enemy which the main weapon of the enemy is lies, and we have the truth. So let's not just get confused about that. Let's study the word to show ourselves approved. But I just want to stay on the human aspect of this. Jesus is looking at Peter and says, look, you don't think you're going to do this, but you're going to fail me. You know, he says it more articulately. He says, by the time the cock crows in the morning, before this night is over, you're going to have denied me three times. How many know that portion of scripture, right? I think we probably all learned it if you were raised in church and heard it in Sunday school, right? And, and then we tie that in with John at the end of John's gospel when Jesus said, do you love me? And what did Peter say? Of course I love you. And then Jesus said, well, if you love me then, what should you do? Take care of my flock. In a couple different ways he said it, like that's you all are the flock. So the role of a minister is to protect and, and shelter, but also develop you into the gifting that God placed in you. And every one of you is a miracle from God that is full of unbelievable potential. We're here to help call it out, to break off Saul's armor, right? If there's any identity that's on you that doesn't belong there, we break it off in Jesus' name. And we say, no, this is the real identity of who God made you to be. And you are going to be a wrecking ball for the kingdom of God. You're going to demolish the strongholds of the enemy for this purpose. Jesus was manifest, right? 1 John 3, 8, to destroy the works of the enemy. And now you will go do the same. We have a, a, a lot of job security as Christians because there's a lot of people that need the Lord. It's a very confusing place. So I'm going to take you back up to the, to the upper room. In John chapter 13 and Luke chapter 22, they both describe the same scene, but we don't believe, the, the historians and the scholars don't believe that Luke was in the upper room. He, he came on board a little bit later. That might be debatable. I'm just telling you. We know John was in the upper room, and we even know where John was sitting, don't we? Right next to Jesus. And it's, he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, <laughs> without naming himself. But we know that. So close that he had his head on the breast of Jesus, and that he could hear the heartbeat of the Lord. Like, what an amazing place to be. I mean, Adriel was talking about that a little bit when he got up to do communion. It's like, Let's just not forget that this is an intimate thing, that we should really cherish this meal. It was a meal that brought sin into the world when, when Eve pulled that fruit off that tree. She did it by eating something and then became defiled. So when we take the Lord's meal, we're reversing that thing. We're putting his body and his blood to remind us it's not by my might. I'm going to start to totally depend on you again today. And it's so much better to do that in the morning, isn't it? Because there's so many landmines the devil will try to put in your path. And Jesus said, lead me not into a landmine. <laughs> Help me walk that narrow road that leads to life today, Lord. Because there will be many chances for the devil 
to, to tease me and tempt me to lose my cool. Right? And you know that's one of the rules of engagement. If the devil's trying to get you, you could have a hundred interactions with somebody, but the one time you slip up and lose your cool, that's what they're going to talk about for the next 50 years. Oh, you call yourself a Christian and you acted like that. Well, what about the other 99 times? <laughs> Doesn't matter. They were baiting you. And if they keep poking at it, that's why it's so important. Proverbs says a man, a woman who can't rule their spirit is like a city with the walls broken down. So Holy Spirit's got to be in charge and say, nope, you said self-control is one of the fruit that I'll experience, and I don't have to run my mouth right now. Even though I'm really good at running my mouth, even though I thought of something really good to say, I can't say it. God, it's like Fonzie. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember, but he couldn't say he was sorry, so he was like, I'm He just couldn't get it out, right? So sometimes we have to restrain our tongue and let the Holy Spirit be in control and say, this is not my fight. The fight belongs to the Lord. I'm not saying don't stand up. I'm just saying run it through the gatekeeper of the Holy Spirit. Is this what you want me to say right now? And boy, when that anointing is on it, demons flee. Just think of David, right, driving away that spirit from Saul just through anointed worship. Well, our lives and our interactions are like that. So if I'm Peter and Jesus says, you're going to fail me three times before the cock crows in the morning, and I can tell you my office that I spend a lot of time in is not too far from here, right on this property, and I hear the cock crow every morning. <laughs> I hear the rooster. I, I, mean, I love it. I love living on this place. It's a farm, really. So there's animals right down on the other side of that fence over there. And, and it just reminds me that they were in a very agra ag agrarian culture, right? So before the alarm clock was off in the morning, Peter, as much as you think you would go with me and you would die for me, you believe that. I'm telling you, you're going you're gonna to deny me three times, but I'm going to pray for you that your faith will not fail. And when you come back from the shame of feeling like you missed it, strengthen your brothers by telling them that you're not disqualified by God if you make a mistake. All right? Could you just lift your hands if you agree with me on that? I am not disqualified. I'm not being court-martialed because I made a mistake. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. All right? And I'm not in the condemnation. I don't live in the nation of condemn. <laughs> I live in the inauguration. <laughs> you get it? Oh, man, which nation are you part of? I'm part of the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen of heaven. I have a new passport that's stamped kingdom of God. So I don't have to operate the way the world does. In fact, when I don't operate the world does, I can shine like a light because they're just not used to that. It's not the easier way, is it? It's not easy to forgive people. It's not easy to come and say you're sorry when you made a mistake. But that's the kingdom operation. And, and he said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, it's not like the world does it where they pull rank on each other. You are a servant. And that's the way you're going to gain favor is through serving other people. Man, I'm sorry. I, I feel like I'm bouncing a little bit. But I'll just I'll, I'll compare these two chapters, Luke 22 and John 13. John is right there with Jesus. We know he's close by. But Luke really wrote the most of the New Testament, right? If you add Luke and Acts... That's actually more volume of words than all of Paul's epistles. Okay, so nobody else wrote more than Luke in the, in the New Testament. And he wasn't even Jewish, right? So it tells you something about God including all of us in there. So I'm not demeaning Luke's version. I'm just saying John brings a very more personal approach. And it says this in John 13 in the Passion, verse 1. Jesus knew the night before Passover would be his last night on earth before leaving this world so he could return to the Father's side. And all throughout this time with the disciples, Jesus had demonstrate, demonstrated a deep and tender love for them. How many have felt that love from the Lord? Right? All the time you've been a disciple. How many times has he forgiven you for mistakes? How many times has he come back to you and said, I'm not court-martialing you. You're still in the army. I'm hurting when you're hurting. I don't want you to live like that. I don't want you to be bound by that addiction. But I'm saved. I should know better. Look, there's a few Christians out there that beat themselves up. I hope none of you are here today. But my gut tells me there are some here today that are beating yourself up 
Maybe because of how you behaved in the last seven months during COVID. Maybe you're surprised at how you reacted to some things. And, you know, the, this isolation tends to percolate. Whatever was inside you already is going to now percolate up to the surface. And John and Paula Sanford would use the example, if you go to a campground in the spring and it hasn't been used all winter and you want to use the pump, what do you have to do? Why? Because it hasn't been used and it's yucky. Did somebody say yucky? That's a great word. It's, it's yucky. So when you pump it at first, all the slime that developed on the top of it during the winter has to get pumped out. <laughs> say la. That's all I'm saying. Just think about your life. We are in isolation like we've never been before. How many of you have ever gone seven months without going to a church service since you've been saved? And how old is Zoom right now? <laughs> I'm grateful for Zoom. Praise God for them. But I like seeing human beings in person, in the flesh. I love hearing you sing. It blesses me. And just being together, like, look around. Have you been in a crowd of people this big in a while? I haven't. It's awesome. Thank you for pushing through. So all I'm saying is we're a lot like Peter. We're on this journey where 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we're being transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. Right? And you'll hear that verse a lot in our culture here because if somebody wonders, when I got saved, is it just now about going to heaven when I die? We would say absolutely not. It's about living the fullest life you can live while you're here. And the more you can be like Christ, the more you will live a full, engaging, powerful, results-driven life. Not just for you, but for the other people around you. So God knew through Peter that he was a flawed vessel, but he was going to use him mightily. So he had to make sure Peter didn't bail. And there's lots of ex examples of him faltering. But I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on this part right here, right? In John 13, he said, it's his last night, and having loved him, I said it earlier, he's now going to demonstrate the fullness of his love for them. Full measure. What did he do in the natural, uh, in the upper room, to demonstrate his love? Do you remember? Yeah, but he first had communion. That's John's version. And then Luke talks about how he washed their feet. John doesn't even mention the foot washing part, but it's all part of the same scene. So now here's God in the flesh getting down and doing the job of a servant in that culture because people walked with sandals. They didn't have regular shoes. So when they came to somebody's home, their feet would have accumulated a lot of dirt during the day. So the first thing you did for hospitality is you had a servant meet them at the door, take the sandals off, and wash their feet because they were coming inside the house now, and it was a very welcoming sign of something to do. Never would a leader do that. Never would the owner of the home do that. Only the lowest servant in the household would take that role. And Jesus is saying to them, I'm going to now demonstrate how I want you to live. <laughs> it's not necessarily going after the, uh, the organizational chart and climbing up the corporate ladder. It's like if you want to be great in this kingdom, you're going to learn how to serve. That's how he demonstrated his love to them. And he said, as I've done this for you, you go and do to others. And that's how they will know that you're my disciples. Not because you've memorized more scripture, but because of the love that you're displaying. It's the way you apply the scripture that you memorize that will be the indication that you're my disciples. But Lord, Lord, we did great miracles in your name. I never knew you. That's a scary verse, isn't it? Starts with love. We said it already earlier today. All right, so then if you go to verse 3 in John 13, it says, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper, laid aside his outer garments, had taken a towel, he tied it around his waist, poured out water in a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet. Excuse me one second. I'll see if I'm misplacing. Good, I got it. So he wipes uh, their feet with the towel that was wrapped around him. A little bit later is when you know, that text verse comes and, and there's dispute among the disciples and they're arguing because you know, Jesus is going to say, one of you at this table is going to betray me. Remember that? We know it was Judas, but they weren't sure. And uh, they start arguing about, no, it couldn't be me because I'm, I have a higher rank than you. <laughs> How fast does that spirit pop up from the dead? Right? That selfish spirit. I crucified it. Yeah, but it resurrected. 
because you, you gave the throne of your heart to your flesh. You forgot to keep Jesus on the throne of your heart. Because like I said, if your gift is in there, it will make room for you. And people will want you to lead. I heard a great man of God say one time, don't ever seek for a platform. Seek for something to say. When you have something to say, people will invite you to speak on their platform. <laughs> Pretty convicting, huh? And then, so he says, I, I pray for you. The devil's trying to sift all of you, but I pray for you. But when you've returned, turn back to me, strengthen your brothers. And Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you even unto death. I'll go to prison. I'll go on to death. Jesus said, no, when the alarm clock goes off this morning, you will have denied me three times. It's a hard word, isn't it? So you get to verse 54 in Luke's gospel, and it's in verse 22, chapter 22, I'm sorry. He says, they had seized Jesus. They led them away. They took him into the house of the high priest. And when those present had a kindled fire going in the courtyard, Peter sat down among them. And a servant girl, girl saw him seated in the firelight and looked at him intently and said, this man was with Jesus. And what did Peter do? He didn't just deny it. He flavored it with a little salty language, didn't he? <laughs> Court martial. You're out. See, that's the nation of condemning. I'm not going to live in the condemnation. <laughs> I'm going to live in the incarnation. Yes. Amen. Jesus is alive. He's incarnate. He came in the flesh, dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. And some didn't receive him. But to whoever did receive him, he gave them the right to be sons and daughters of God. <laughs> oh, even Peter, with his flaws and his failties, so I may have failed the Lord, but he doesn't fail me, and my faith is not going to fail. So if I, if I disappointed him in something, I'm not out, but I'm the one that got hurt by that. So I have to determine in my heart to be intentional to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to let that thing win over the Spirit of God in my life. I hate it enough to do what, I'll do whatever it takes to get rid of it. And you, you talk to any counselors on our team here, that's music to our ears, that the person hates that thing enough, we give them an assignment to do, and they come back the following week. They not only read the assignment that we gave them, they read the book that was referenced in the assignment that we gave them. You know, that's a hungry person. I'm not saying we wouldn't help anybody. It just goes a lot better when you're hungry and you hate the thing that you're trying to get rid of. You can't love it more than you love God. Amen? Amen. So he, he could have easily been walking in shame. Jesus warned him that you're going to deny me three times, and then he did deny him three times. How would you have felt? Shamed, right? Easily shamed. Possibility, anyway. So then in verse 59, this is the third denial. An hour later, a man insisted, certainly this man was with him. I can tell by his accent that he's from Galilee, and that's where Jesus is from. And, and Peter says, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And while he was speaking, Peter said, the rooster crowed. And then it says in verse 61, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Because they were right in the same courtyard. And I'm going to tell you, this is the word that the Lord gave me. This is the scene that he brought me to. I really believe somebody here is walking in some condemnation. And that you think if this was you, that the Lord would be glaring at you with contempt. You stinking loser. How could you have denied me three times? You said you'd go to prison. That's not Jesus. That's the devil, okay? That's what I'm here to tell you. Let's just break shame off right now. Say, shame off me. Shame off me. I'm a son and a daughter of a living God. You can say that, whichever one you are. And, and I am not court-martialed for making a mistake. Now, look, I know there's, you know... Uh, a hyper grace movement in the world right now. I'm not saying you're not accountable for the mistakes that you make. I'm saying it doesn't disqualify you from serving the Lord. And Peter was not disqualified. But I really believe like this was a tipping point moment for him. If that third denial had come on the prediction, anybody praying for deliverance from bees? In Jesus' name, they will all die. They, uh, they were supposed to be gone by now, but there's still, there's still a couple here. <laughs> I keep getting them in my communion cup. They must really like the communion cup. Yeah, it's sweet. So, look, here's the deal. I'm in the moment, and I look across Jesus, 
as I'm reading this. And if I'm already walking in shame, then I'm picturing him looking at me in shame. But if I'm walking in an understanding of how much God loves me and how much the Father loves me and how much he said, don't worry, Peter, even when you fail me. He warned him, don't worry, even when you fail me, I'm going to pray for you. And your faith is not going to fail. Your actions might have come short, but your faith is not going to fail. And it's not just going to be for you, but you're going to strengthen your brothers. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can be here to strengthen each other today. So before you leave, spend time with people. There's people here you haven't seen in a while. Keep the distance. I get it. If we're outside and you're far enough away from each other, you don't have to keep the mask on. But just use wisdom. Just be smart about how you're handling it, right? And just... Pull from the, from the well of, of covenant relationships with other people because we were not meant to be alone. It's not good for a man and a woman to be alone. You guys good? Yeah. All right, so for anybody who's worried about the culture, I just want to read something to you, a quote, and then I'll finish in Philippians and we'll be done. Thank you, mate. <laughs> I'm telling you, we are here to strengthen each other. He has a strengthening anointing. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. A few more of you should ask for that strength. <laughs> you guys remember the movie uh, Big Fat Creek Wedding? Yeah. So I think that, I think her family is more of a picture of the church than his family. Remember, like, they were crazy, but they loved each other. And then when you see the scene at, at his house, it's just the mother and the father and him, and nobody's talking right? It's like they're not encouraging each other. But like, what is this bunt cake? I don't know bunt. It's got a hole in the middle. What kind of cake has a hole in the middle? Yeah. They might have been crazy, but they loved each other. It's a good picture of the church. Like, we're not perfect people. We still come in with our flaws. We accept each other with our flaws. But we try to strengthen each other to be men and women that are after God's own heart. So for anybody who's feeling a caving in of, oh, my God, the world's collapsing because of the election and the contesting of the election and all, all, just the chaos that's going on, I would warn you to protect your heart. That's what the Bible says. Guard your heart for out of it flow the issues of life. So guard your eye gate and your ear gate and be careful that you have more word going in you than you have news going in you. You, you want to have the news because you want to know how to pray. But remember, the battle belongs to the Lord. It's not by our might and power. So this is a man who became a Christian after a long secular career that he had, and he was very humbled by God because he was a historian prior to getting saved. His name is Malcolm Muggeridge. He was alive, you know, I think he might have died, I don't know, in the 80s or 90s, I don't remember, but he was active during World War II, before World War II. He's a British writer and highly successful guy. And he's reflecting back on how politics will come and go and seasons change, but God's still standing. And God is still on the throne. And it's right in the name of our church. He is the king of kings. Right? So all the political stuff does impact our lives. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. But it's not the ultimate answer. Right? God is still on the throne. He didn't take a, a week off because he's, uh, what, post-traumatic stress from the election. No. So bear with me and listen to this brilliant Englishman and the way he thought about this thing that we're in right now. He wouldn't have known the specifics, but he's like, really, you're getting rattled by the politics? Just think about who you serve. He said, we look back on history, and what do we see? Empires rising and falling, revolutions, counter-revolutions. Wealth accumulates, then wealth is dispersed. One nation is dominant, and then another. Shakespeare speaks of the rise and fall of the great ones that ebb and flow like the moon. In one lifetime, his own, I have seen my own fellow countrymen, this is England now, right, ruling over a quarter of the known world. The great majority of those Britons were convinced in the words of what is still a favorite song that God who has made the mighty would make them mightier yet. So pride, he was accusing his countrymen of pride. Then he says, I've heard a crazed, cracked Austrian proclaimed to the world the establishment of a German Reich that would last a thousand years. Who might that be? An Italian clown, got to keep my family in there, <laughs> announced that he would restart the calendar begin, to begin his own assumption of power. Who would that have been? Mussolini. 
I've heard a murderous George and Brigand in the Kremlin, acclaimed by the intellectual elite, as wiser than Solomon, more enlightened than Ashoka, and more humane than Marcus Aurelius. Who would that have been? Stalin. I've seen America, wealthier and in terms of weaponry, more powerful than the rest of the world put together so that Americans, had they so wished, could have outdone Alexander the Great and conquered the world. All in one lifetime, all gone with the wind. England is now a part of a tiny little island off the coast of Europe, threatened with dismemberment. Hitler and Mussolini are dead, remember only in infamy. Stalin, a forbidden name in the regime that he helped found and dominate for three decades. America, haunted by fears of running out of oil so she can keep her motorways roaring. <laughs> All in one lifetime. All gone with the wind. <laughs> So good. Behind the debris of those self-styled supermen, diplomats, imperialists, there stands the gigantic figure of one person, because of whom, and by whom, and in whom, and through whom, alone, mankind might still have hope. Amen. That person is Jesus Christ. See, God took what the devil meant for evil in that guy's life, and he turned it for good. He died a long time ago, but the brilliance of his writing still lives on, sanctified by the presence of God. So those great musicians and singers and people you see on Facebook that are so secular pray that God puts a revival in their life. It happened to Kanye West, right? I mean, I don't know the current state of his life, but... Like for a while, like he was the only thing anybody was talking about. Can you believe that he's serving God? Like the, the things the devil meant for evil, God can turn out for good. And why not believe for the best in people? Why should we condemn them and say they'll never change? Why should we call them idiots because they don't agree with us? Mm, say amen or ouch. God doesn't call him an idiot. He might have you here to show them a different way. And they might scream and shout about it. If you've ever been delivered, you know the demons don't like to leave without making a lot of noise on the way out. <laughs> well, you know, John Sanford said, it's like a nail that's been in place a long time. When you pull it out, it's going, yeah. but it's coming out. Yeah. Make all the noise you want, you're coming out. <laughs> so I'm going to finish up in Philippians chapter 2. Because remember that the, uh, the disciples were quarreling over who was going to be the greatest among them. And Jesus said, the world does that. We don't. That's a different kingdom. The world gives you indoctrination. I will give you illumination. <laughs> Which one do you want to live in? Which nation? I used to live in hallucination. <laughs> Until I got illumination. <laughs> I was bound for extermination. <laughs> Till I got a car nation. <laughs> yeah, hey. Aha. Which nation you want? You want to be an impersonation? <laughs> or do you want your God destination? Mm -hmm. It's a lot of nations out there. Psalm 2 says, I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Amen. We read that today. That was read right up here. Kiss the sun. Amen. That's what we do. We're going to kiss you, Lord. Is it easy? Absolutely not. You know, like people say about New York City, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And there's really a lot of truth to that. I, I love being in the city. I love being with the intellectual capital that's over there, the brilliance of the people in my industry that work in the finance industry and Wall Street. They come from all over the world. And like for every job, there's 20 other people that want that job, right? So like the competition is brutal. But when they get saved, man, they, they go through the word like a ravishing person who hasn't eaten food in, in years. Like they just devour the word. It's amazing how radical the transformation is. So you never condemn anybody, right? 
God doesn't do it. Right? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death from the devil that we were born into. I can eat the meal that heals when I take communion. I can be tapping into that divine nature on the inside of me on a daily basis. So this is what Paul says as, as a, a charge to the troops. Braveheart, right? Remember Mel Gibson riding on his horse in front of them? Yeah, you guys could turn around and go back right now, but what are you going to tell your kids? How are you going to live with yourself? Knowing that in the moment of truth, you backed off and ran. You might want to live that way. I'm not going to live that way. And I would have followed him into battle, even though he had that weird face paint thing going on. <laughs> so this is how you should think among yourselves. With the mind that you have because you belong to Christ, who though in God's form did not regard his equality with God as something that he should exploit. You know, like if you're a boss... And one of your employees is giving you a hard time, and you say, do you know who I am? It's like, oh, boy, we're in trouble. The boss doesn't know who he is. <laughs> if you say, do you know who I am, you lost already. They knew who you were the day you got hired. They got hired. You're trying to pull rank. But you're not being a very inspiring leader when you say that. I'm not going to do it just because you said to do it just because you're the boss if you're treating me with contempt. So you typically go to that line because you've got no other line. You have to do it because I said. Well, that's if you're the coach of the football team, you're going to lose your games because people want to be inspired by your example even when you mess up. So Peter messed up, and Jesus said, don't worry. Your faith is not going to fail. And when you come back, you're going to strengthen your brothers. They're going to look at you and say, even though Peter messed up, he got over it. He repented. And Judas, when he, when he messed up, he killed himself. Right? There's a, there's a worldly sorrow that leads to death. But there's a godly sorrow that leads to life and repentance. And guilt might not be the worst thing in the world. There's certain kinds of guilt that we need to understand. It's not really guilt. It's conviction. Right, but some kinds of guilt is condemning, and some kind is just conviction. It's like, no, I, I, I'm Hebrew national hot dogs. I answer to a higher authority. I'm not going to be like the world. I don't care what the standard of the world is. I got a different standard that I'm following. So let that mind be in you, who Christ, even though he could have pulled rank, did not pull rank. It's a little harder to understand in the King James, you know. He, you know, it says he did not consider equality to be God, something to be, I don't, I don't even remember, it was a while ago when I read it. This just speaks to me. It says he didn't exploit the fact that he was equal with God. That speaks to our heart, doesn't it? And a lot of the humbling things that we go through are there to remind us we can't do it without him. We're not independent, and we're not codependent. We're interdependent. Codependent is what Jack Frost said, two ticks, no dog. That's a life-sucking relationship. The relationship you're in is pulling all the life out of you. It's not redemptive. You're being drained all the time. You need to be around life-giving relationships. I'm not saying reject people that are not that, but if you're not getting some life on the side here, you're not going to have anything to give out. Right? I don't mean to stray. I'm just saying, as part of the kingdom, when you serve in the kingdom, you learn a lot about yourself. Okay? It's not just Bible verses. It's how do I apply these Bible verses. As you're serving people, and, and we are now, some of you have been great about bringing food and bringing clothes, and we're going to be out in the community and handing out this stuff. That's a great act of love, right? That's a sacrificial act of love that those of us that have been blessed are now turning around, as it says in Genesis, we've been blessed to do what? Be to be a blessing. You're showing the love of God. And what did he do? Instead of pulling rank on us, he emptied himself and received the form of a servant. Excuse me being born in the likeness of humans, and even having a human appearance, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. So how would that apply to us? It's not our natural life. Yes, I mean, you know, some people are, are being martyred today. That's not happening in, in the United States, and let's pray it never does. But we do, we're, we're commanded by Jesus to pick up our cross daily and follow him. Not pick up his cross, Pick up my cross. I can only pick up mine. You can only pick up yours. 
And you know, it's not easy because crucifixion is painful. <laughs> right? Something has to die. So if he's telling us daily to do that, that means there's something we can be working on with God every day. And there's nothing to be ashamed about that. And I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself because I know I've said it before. But th this is part of the suffering of Christ. He came in the world and he was tempted to sin, but he did not sin. That's a suffering. You know, denying your passions is a form of suffering because you're obedient to God. So let's not translate the Bible to say, if we love people, we'll just treat them the way they want to be treated. If you love them and you know they're in sin, you have to tell them they're in sin. That's what Jesus did to the woman caught in adultery. Go and sin no more. Because I love you. Sin is going to destroy your life. The wages of sin is death. Anybody got one of those paychecks from the devil? Come on, I'm the only one? All right, not, not lately. I'm saying before you got saved. Yeah. I haven't gotten one lately either, thank God. <laughs> Don't plan on getting any either. You know, and I said earlier, when I wanted to sing an anthem, you know, before we ended worship. And I, that's how I look at that song, How Great Is Our God. Like, it's just one of those things that's so good to remind yourself, you know. And when you sing it together, there's an amplification. And, you know, the name above all names, worthy of all the praise, right? Like, that's so good to keep reminding yourself because there's so much competing throne room stuff, trying to get the throne of your heart. No, 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 sorry. God so greatly exalted him for being obedient to what the mission was, not to pull rank, not to call other people out, not to court martial people that made a mistake, to tell Peter, look, you're going to fall, but I'm going to pray for you so that when you come back, now just put yourself back around that campfire when Jesus looks at him. And Jesus is looking at him like a loving father would look at a child and say, it's okay, Peter, don't bail on me right now. In this moment of shame, when you're hearing that rooster crow and you're remembering that I told you this would happen, I warned you that this would happen. So we don't have to beat ourselves up about mistakes that we've made. You know, we're in the counseling room a lot. I've been counseling a lot of people in the last few weeks and I'm not condemning anybody about it, but it's been a rough ride through COVID. Not everybody's handling the isolation well and the inability to connect with other people. So cut yourself a little slack, but don't approve sin. But man, I'm telling you, some people just have to learn how to forgive themselves for the mistakes they're making. I'm sure Peter had to do that. So look, can we just stand together for a minute? I want to just finish with another verse, but while we're standing, and uh, you don't have to, self-identify if you're dealing with shame in your life. I just feel really strongly that the Lord wanted to get this message across today that he's not rejecting you just because you might have made a mistake. I said it earlier, things surface. When we're in isolation, things surface. They might not have come out. You might not have noticed. Like, let's just say God gave this example. He used to work in the oil field and whenever they got a new pipe, they would put a cap on one end and, and they'd pump water into it with a meter on it and they would test it to see if there was any leaks in the pipe. You get it? Smart thing to do before you put it in the, in the ground. And he said they would, they would raise the pressure to get it up to whatever the manufacturer said and there wouldn't be any leaks. But then they would increase the pressure a little bit higher and all of a sudden you'd see a little spurt of water coming out. So the crack was there it just didn't get exposed until the pressure was too intense. So that's all I'm trying to tell you. If you're beating yourself up, let go of that thing. Break off condemnation off your life today. When Jesus looked at Peter, it wasn't a condemning look, in my opinion. <laughs> that's all that is. It's my interpretation. I think Peter looked at, I think Jesus looked at Peter, who was expecting to be shamed, and it was like, no, sir, no, sir, you're not out. I'm praying for you, and your faith is not going to fail. Not only you, Peter, you're going to strengthen the brothers that are around you. So I speak over you, every one of you, that that's who you're going to be, that Jesus is praying for you right now. Financial issues, job insecurity, whatever the thing is that's trying to rattle you, what the devil means for evil, God is going to turn it around for good. It says in verse 10, that now at the name of Jesus, every knee under heaven shall bow 
and on the earth too, and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But we make that confession today, that my knee bows today to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you've been ransomed unto God, just lift your hands, okay? So you got, thank you, Lord, that you gave your life as the purchase price to free me from the slavery of death and sin. And you sacrificed yourself to be the ransom payment for my salvation. Help me do what we just read in Philippians, that we would let your mind be in us that we, instead of exploiting our positions, would take on the form of a servant and love the confused people in this world, not condemn them, but love them into your kingdom. Trisha, did you have something? Or, okay, I'm just gonna, just gonna just say, if there's somebody visiting here, if there's somebody watching on the live stream and they don't know the Lord, how many here think today would be a good day for them to get saved? Yes. Be a little more Pentecostal, all right? Yeah. Thank you. I know we're in the Somerset Hills. It's very proper up here. When you get delivered from drugs, man, you're screaming like a, like a crazy person because you're so happy. That's all I'm telling you. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. All right? So... I just want to say a prayer for anybody who might be here today and you don't know the Lord, you've never asked him in your heart. We get visitors every week, right? So I don't know who's here. And I would feel like I'm, it's malpractice if we, don't, if we don't give you a chance just to invite the Lord into your life and just say a prayer of invitation that says, I don't have all the answers yet, Lord, but I'm, I'm seeking after you. I want your power operating in my life. Amen? So can we all say it out loud together? Heavenly Father come to you in the name of Jesus. I related with the story of Peter. I've done many things wrong in my life. And I can feel condemned about it. But I heard about forgiveness today. I heard about a loving Jesus who accepts me even in spite of my failures. And I want to have that faith that will not fail. I want that ransom payment of your sacrifice for my sin. I ask you to help me, Lord, to understand how to be your disciple. I repent and turn from my sin. I recognize I can't save myself, but I need a savior. So would you come into my life and give me the help I've been looking for to resist sin and to live a life that will glorify you and glorify your Father. Fill me with your spirit to empower me to serve you the rest of my life and to spend eternity with you, Lord. I surrender my will and say, not my will, but your will be done in my life. I accept you as my Lord today. Jesus Christ, my Savior. Amen. Amen.